let's get into the issue of uh, general integrity. Is, is that what you would call it, general integrity? Issue? Yeah, that's that's the term we use. I mean, it's a tricky term because people who are into activism, because people who are new to it don't know either of those terms, so they have to be explained. But the thing is, like, it's a, it's funny, but the battle does sometimes end up being fought over the terminology. And this is a lawyer thing that defining the terms of the conflict is often the first step in, you know, having the having the battle go more in the direction that you're hoping that it will go in. Um, because the standard terminology is like circumcised and uncircumcised. Well, what uncircumcised is like, what un, are you unamputated if you have both your arms and both your legs? I mean, you know, it, it's crazy terminology if you really look at it, but it's a terminology that's familiar to us because, I mean, one, the time when I was born, most baby boys were circumcised, almost all of them. So there was a time when that was the norm. And I mean, even today, the data is a little hard to tease out, but around 50% are, are still being circumcised. Some, I mean, it might be less than that, but it's, yeah, it's certainly between 30% and 60%, somewhere in that range. So, I mean, we get conflicting data. I mean, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention came out with this study in 2010 that, that gave pretty low numbers. And um, I mean, they're the Centers for Disease Control, so you would think you could take their data at face value, and that's what we did. But Nobody really knows, and the problem, one of the problems is like, circumcisions aren't always recorded. They aren't even recorded. Like, um, it, it can happen to the baby, and there's no reimbursement for it, and so there's no need to record. So, so you don't even end up knowing. Mm. So that's one of the many strange things about this yeah. issue. So what kind of work do you do in this arena? Well, I do a lot of things. I, I founded this organization, Attorneys for the Rights of the Child, in 1997, and um, we went to the United Nations in 2001. I, I put a team together, and we went over there, and I gave oral and written presentations that became part of the UN record. To this day, they're the only documents we know of that the UN has that are centrally devoted to male circumcisions and human rights violation. Um, we put out a newsletter that's on its 22 eighth issue now. We've been doing that for about 12 years, and um, that's picked up by the three leading content providers and libraries across North America. And I do a lot of writing. I've published 25 or so peer-reviewed articles on various aspects of the topic. I've looked at um, female cutting and intersex cutting and cosmetic female genital cutting, which is a whole other issue of, of grown adult women. Um, having circumcision done to them or, or, form, or aspects of general cutting done to them for cosmetic reasons, which is a whole different issue than being done to children, obviously. Um, I mean, I, there's so many, it, it's strange because I always feel like, okay, how much can you say about this little topic? But it, it's so rich in so many ways. I mean, not entirely in good ways. I mean, it's got religious aspects to it and, and sexual aspects and psychology, deep, deep issues of sort of group psychology of like why do we do this as a society and also individual psychology it can have impact psychologically on individuals that it was done to um, there's obviously medical aspects to it and sociological so it, it's a very rich topic there's actually um, two books being worked on right now by two uh, academics in two different disciplines that are going to partially look at the intactivist movement that have interviewed me and other activists. So there's a lot of interest. It's a very interesting, multifarious topic. So what are the, the reasons that uh, performing a circumcision on a baby boy is so wrong? What are those reasons? Well, it's wrong because the child should have the right to make their own decisions about their own body as long as there's no medical necessity to, to do a procedure. And there is no, no medical necessity. And even the American Academy of Pediatrics agrees with that their most recent position statement sort of inched closer to supporting circumcision, but they had to admit that, that the risks, um, the risk and benefit calculation doesn't suggest that it should be done automatically. And in fact, they even admitted that, I mean, they made these two contradictory statements. They said that the benefits exceed the risks and that publicly funding it makes sense, which is scandalous. Then they also said, but we don't know what the risks are. We need further studies. So how can you know the benefits exceed the risks if you don't know what the risks are? Obviously, it makes no sense. But um, that, that was what they said. So we're doing this thing that isn't, isn't justified. Uh, why are we doing it? Well, it's partly cultural inertia. It's been around for a while. It feels familiar to us. 
fathers have had it done and they feel like they're not really sure what the benefits were, but I guess maybe I should do it to my son. Uh, it's this crazy thought of, so he looks like me, but somehow he doesn't need to look like me in any other way, just in that way. And um, it, it's just this odd thing that perpetuates itself for no good reason. And, and here we are. I mean, Norm Cohen said this of, of No Circuit Michigan, said this almost 20 years ago in the Whose Body, Whose Rights video that Tim Hammond did that got some awards and was shown on National Public Radio in the 90s. I mean, Norm said, we've been to the moon. We've done all these amazing things, and I could say this more now than I could then. We have iPhones. You know, we're, we're, we're putting up these space satellites, and we're going to have private enterprise sending us up into space. And we're still doing this thing that started, medicalized version of it started 150 years ago, back when we were in the Dark Ages. I mean, doctors did not know what they were doing. I mean, there were these fluky events that happened with this Dr. Lewis Sayre, and he, and he saw them, and he concluded from them that, oh, circumcision must be the, the cure for all these problems, and it was completely wrong. And... and We've proven the, just proven these myths of the benefits, so-called, that it has so many times till we're blue in the face, but the idea has caught hold, and it's hard to undo an idea, even if it's a bad idea. It, it has persistence, and so that, that's the work that we're doing, is to really educate people. And I mean, you know, there's certain forces that are flowing in our direction. There's the internet, there's increased skepticism toward authority. There's an increased willingness of um, people to do research on the internet and come to their doctors and say, hey, I found on the internet that, you know, chopping off your left arm is really good. For, I mean, I shouldn't say that because it's it usually, I mean, they, they, they come in with research off the internet. My, it drives my wife crazy because she's a doctor and a lot of times patients will come in very poorly informed. But at the same time, there is this tendency for patients to inform themselves and, and get information and ask physicians about it, which would never happen 20, 30 years ago. I mean, A, there was no internet. And B, there was just more willingness to accept the authority of, of authorities. And for better or worse, I mean, we're in a new game now. And so some of these forces are moving in the direction of educating people about, about that circumcision may not be necessary. But on the other hand, there's this, there's this feeling of threat that, that can come in. Um, Jewish leaders can feel it. They can feel like, oh, this is a really important right for us. And, and if if the non-Jewish people aren't doing it, then maybe that'll somehow endanger our ability to continue doing it. Um, I mean, I think the Jew Jewish community has to work out the issue among themselves. I don't think outsiders, you know, people who aren't Jewish can come in and sort of impose solutions on them. Um, and, and I think things evolve. You know, there's all sorts of doctrine that, both religious and non-religious, that people used to really adhere, adhere to. I mean, when I was a kid, they thought they had to take out the adenoids and the tonsils. I mean, nobody does that anymore. I mean, we're learning, it's a continual learning process, and that's what human rights is about, which I've done a lot of work. And I mean, human rights sort of started with the Magna Carta, sort of gained strength after World War II with the Nuremberg trials. And, but really moving up, I mean, the Convention on the Rights of the Child came into force in 88, 89. And so it's really been a continual evolution of um, understanding and of, and of, I mean, if you watch, you read, you, I, I, I watch a lot of Charles Dickens, or I read a lot of Charles Dickens. I mean, Charles Dickens wrote about how children were seen as chattel. That was only 150 years ago. I mean, 160 years ago. Things have changed a lot, and they're continuing to evolve. So it's this archaic procedure that definitely was um, risky back when uh, medicine and, and uh Doctors didn't always know what they were doing or using clean tools and all that. Now that uh, the medical industry has evolved and gotten better and safer, isn't it, isn't it a safe procedure? Is there really that many things that go wrong? Well, what does safe mean? I mean, the thing is normally what you mean by safe is safe enough. And what does that mean? Well, you're doing a procedure that has medical benefits. So it's a calculated risk. I mean, any procedure has complications by definition. But every other procedure, the complications are taken along with the good. There's a countervailing good that's greater, that has to be greater than the risks, or else you wouldn't do the procedure. I mean, Frederick Hodges and a couple others and I wrote about this way back in 2002. I mean, you, that's the thing that's different about male circumcision is there is no benefit that justifies the practices. And as I say, even the American Academy of Pediatrics with all their members that perform circumcisions and, and feeling, I am imagining, feeling beholden to them and inching gradually toward a more pro-circumcision statement, which is really odd given the way things are flowing the other way with 
Germany court declaring it illegal last year and all these European uh, medical associations declaring it completely unjustified. And just last year, or just this year, um, this whole group of European, primarily European doctors made this very strong statement about how male circumcision is ridiculous, essentially, like why would you even consider doing it? Um, so all these forces flowing towards stopping the practice and the American Academy of Pediatrics is isolating itself and moving the other direction, but still they're not saying that there's a medical necessity for it. They can't say that. There's no evidence for that, and they know that. And you know, they, their review of the evidence was very selective. They left out a lot of very important studies that had come out in time that they could have reviewed them. A very selective review. Um, they excluded case studies entirely, which cut out a lot of the studies about complications that are very important for showing what the problems are. I mean, there's been reputable studies showing that the number of deaths annually are in the U.S. must be over 100. Nobody knows the exact number, but but the thing is, those 100 babies, every one of those 100 babies has a mother. Every one of those 100 babies has a father. Every one of those 100 babies was mourned by their parents. And every one of those 100 babies, 150 babies, died needlessly. You do another practice that has a need. There's a reason for it. You're doing it. And it is a shame that a child dies. But these children died for no reason because there's no benefit that justifies doing male circumcision. We don't have the luxury to do that. A, we care about people. We don't want to kill babies needlessly. B, we don't even have enough medical resources to keep everybody properly healthy, even if we're focusing on what's necessary. We've got to get this thing up, regardless. It, it's, it's, it's outdated. It's really just so unneeded and barbaric. And you know, even if you don't care about the children, just do it, to, just do it for efficiency. Just do it because we, we don't have the resources if we ever did. We certainly don't have them now. To, to do practices that, where the benefits don't justify the cost. And oh, that's the other thing I was going to say was this risk-benefit analysis that the AAP does, the American Academy of Pediatrics, well, what's left out of that? Let's think about this. Risks and benefits, hmm. What about the functionality of the foreskin? Risks and benefits, all they're doing is saying, you know, how much urinary tract infection does it supposedly prevent, which, by the way, girls get more UTIs than boys, but nobody wants to circumcise girls. How many UTIs does it prevent versus how much bleeding is going to happen, ignoring the deaths and everything. What about the functionality of the foreskin? There's a 100% rate in circumcision of losing tissue that has function. Why don't they look at that? That's completely left out of the equation. The American Academy of Pediatrics in 2013, 2012, does not talk once in their position statement and technical report, not once, about the function of the foreskin, about the importance of the foreskin, about what the foreskin does. There is not one word in that report about that. And that is criminal. That is criminal. And I say that, I say that literally. What function does it have? I'm sorry, I don't know. The, the foreskin protects the penis. It has erogenous, also known as sexual functions, which are, which are very important. I mean, it's, it's half the surface tissue of the penis. So if you think about it logically, you lose half the surface tissue of the penis. Of course it's going to have an impact on sexuality. I mean, and there have been studies showing that, but it's just at a gut level, come on. And you're going to try to seriously tell me you're going to take half the surface tissue out and it's going to have no impact? How could that be? Moses Maimonides, 800 years ago, recommended circumcision for that exact reason. He said, a benefit of circumcision is it reduces sexual sensitivity, and that's good. Um, I mean, he was writing for the Jewish community, but, but that was seen as a benefit. So if he knew that 800 years ago, I think we're smart enough to know that today. And the, other, the third function of the um, foreskin is, is immunological. So it has three important functions, and, um, and more could be said about each of them. But... Um, and the other thing is, like, how many parents watch their kid being circumcised? How many parents watch the pain? They're, they're not allowed to, I mean, typically. And I mean, even if you're, they're anesthetized, they still have serious pain. And the anesthetic carries risks, too, if it's done. It's mind-boggling. I mean, when my son was born, I was asked five or six times. I mean, I didn't tell anybody that I was working on this issue. I, I didn't see a point. I didn't see a reason to. And I was asked five or six times, do you want a circumcision? I said no every time. If I'd said yes once, do you think they would have come back to me another five times? Oh, are you sure you want the circumcision? Oh, are you sure you want it? And I said to the nurse, you know, there's no reason to be doing this. That's the only thing I said to her from my work. There's no reason to be doing this. She said, I know. It's like, you know, well, then why are you offering it to the patients? Is, aren't you a nurse? I mean, isn't your job to do medical procedures? I mean, it's mind-boggling. It really is. Let's take two minutes.
topic. What do you what do you say to people who um, argue that it's a religious right? You know, the answer to that is your freedom to practice your religion stops at the skin of another person. And that's what Prince versus Massachusetts, the U.S. Supreme Court case, which was decided a long time ago, back before we really had reached the level of understanding of, you know, of human rights and of children's rights that we're starting to have today. Um, but Prince versus Massachusetts says you can make a martyr of yourself. You know, you can go out on the street. Um, you can do. It. You're an adult. You can. You can as long as you're not violating the law. You can make a martyr of yourself in whatever way you want to, but you can't make a martyr of your child. Your your child carries his or her own independent set of rights that they're clothed in when they're born. I mean, that's the remarkable concept of human rights, which people didn't always have. Again, back in Dickens's time, that Charles Dickens's time, they didn't have it. But, but this was really the, the sort of um, amazing, to us now, a lot of us, it's commonplace, but this was really the sort of amazing concept that when you're born, you're clothed in these entitlements that, that safeguard you and that guarantee you certain things and, and that um, some of the human rights documents that have been generated since World War II have been designed to protect. And um, so, yeah, you know, yeah, it's, it's great that you have your religion, you know, more power to you, and religion has, has done many good things for the world, and let, let it flourish, and, let, you know, let's hope that when your child grows up, they may choose to follow the religion you're in, but that's their decision, you know. If, I mean, you cannot force a child to follow a religion, I and mean, you can't do that. I mean, and there, are, there are human rights that say that, to protect your right of self-determination and religious self-determination. Um, I, mean, I mean, I can understand as a parent, it, it, you know, there are times when you really want your child to do something, and it's really tempting to try to use every quiver in your bow to try to enforce that, but I'm sorry. You know, your child gets to make these own decisions, and you may not like them, and that's just the way it is. Yeah. It all, it all depends on the focus. I mean, somebody pointed out that... Um, you know, there's this there's this sign that's sometimes used by intactivists that says "My body, my rights," which sounds fairly straightforward. And and um, one of one of the act activists was saying that she was at a rally and she missed saw the sign for a second and, it, and thought that it said "My boy, my rights," and she realized, I mean, it's just removing the D from body, right? My boy, my rights instead of my body, my rights. I mean, that's really how the people on the other side view things: is they have this right to do this thing to their children. And we're really, it, it's worth taking a step back because we're really unique in the U.S. in our view of so-called parental rights. I don't even like that term, but there's really this concept that has really developed in the U.S. It's part, perhaps partly related to our heavy Puritan background. I don't really know all that goes into it, but um, there's a large faction of, in this country that still really believes that you know, parents really can do pretty much anything to their kids. And that's what Prince versus Massachusetts was about, to, to contradict that and say, no, you can make a martyr of yourself, you can't make a martyr of your child. Um, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, guess who the only country with a functioning government in the world that hasn't ratified it and brought it into legal status is? It's the U.S. We're the only country with a functioning government. And, um, and why is that? Well, there's been a lot of fight over it. I mean, there's been a lot of people... You know, the Senate has to ratify treaties, and there's been a lot of senators, a good number from the South, not entirely. Um, you know, <laughs> constituents want to, want to feel free to do whatever they want to to their kids, and you just can't do that. I mean, the, the paradigm is different than it was 50, 60 years ago. And some, it's, it's hard to adjust sometimes, but, you know, we're in a different era now. We've seen... We've seen Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We've seen, you know, Dachau, Auschwitz. I've been there. I mean, we've seen those places. I mean, it's not the same as it used to be. We, we need to be a little more humble and a little more respectful of everybody's right to being. Do you know what the rate of death from this procedure currently is? In the US? Well, nobody knows exactly because the data isn't, isn't kept. And I... I think it's one of those things, I don't think that there was a bunch of guys in a smoke-filled room that sat around and thought, ha, 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 we're going to not track the death rate of circumcisions. That way they won't be able to show it. But I do think that, you know, there's been financial disincentives to track it. I, I think nobody really wants to know the answer. It'd be extra work. Like I say, I mean, not even all circumcisions are recorded. So, you know, how would all circumcision deaths be recorded? But it's pretty reliably known that, that they're in the, and there's been studies that Dan Bollinger put out a study, and there's a study from... Brazil that corroborates the, the idea that you know, something on the order of 150 plus or minus 
deaths per year in the U.S. I mean, nobody knows exactly. It's not one. It's not two. And we, we, we have some anecdotal knowledge about specific incidents, but then there's, there's reliable, um, reliable studies that have shown that the numbers are up. And it's not surprising, really. I mean, the number actually is not, not surprising that it's that number. It's hard to see how it could be much lower, given that, I mean, every procedure does have risks, like I, like I was saying earlier. I mean, every medical procedure goes wrong occasionally. Um, I mean, there was this procedure that, that happened um, where a, a boy lost his, his penis, and um, then John, Dr. John Money of um, Johns Hopkins, who was this expert supposedly on um, gender identification, um, said, oh, it's no problem. We can just come in and change the boy to a girl, and, and that's what they did. And then the boy became an adult and said, no, you know, actually, I'm a boy. And it was this whole big dramatic thing, and the, the, Dr. John Money was sort of outed in the early... 2000s by two very well-known colleagues and um, and then and then the the boy the man ended up committing suicide and also his twin brother who it's an odd story because his twin brother was not circumcised and stayed intact but his twin brother was so messed up by the whole experience that he also ended up committing suicide so that's two deaths we know about right there and that story was written up um, at book length oh my god these things happen. I mean, you know, there's, there's boys that lose their penises. There's boys that lose part of their penises. Um, but again, it has to be remembered that there's a 100% complication rate to circumcision because 100% of the time you lose functional tissue without a countervailing medical justification. I, I mean, apart from the very rare, there, there perhaps are extremely rare cases where it actually is medically justified. I mean, those cases around the edges, you know, the one in 100, one in 1,000 cases. I mean, but apart from those... So... So the mother talks to the doctor or the, the parents talk to the doctor before, like long before the birth and say whether or not they want their son circumcised. And then after she gives birth, the baby's just whisked away and she never knows nothing more. She doesn't see it happen. And No, they don't show the parents. They don't want the parents to see. And it, it doesn't happen in any one way. I mean, it, it happens a lot of different ways. I mean, sometimes the parents aren't asked until right before the procedure. I mean, I was involved, I was a lawyer in this whole class action case, federal class action, civil rights case that we brought in New York City that actually the most racially diverse square mile of the world in New York City, the hospital there had this pattern and practice of going into Latina mothers while they were drugged from the drugs they gave them at childbirth in English, not in Spanish, um, saying, do you want to have your child circumcised? But actually, in some cases, they wouldn't even say that. They'd say, please sign this so that your child can go home. And then they'd give them the form. Page one in English had all, these, had all this boilerplate about circumcision. But they'd give them the page two, which just had like the signature space at the top, and say, please sign this. And they did this over and over. We, we collected plaintiffs. We, we tried to bring a class action, but we had an incredibly biased judge who, who killed our case before we were able to, to um, move further with it. But anyway, I mean, you know, that just came to our attention. And I'm sure that's more egregious than most cases, but um, the so-called consent forms, most of them, almost all of them, they don't, prop as you might imagine, they don't properly explain the ramifications of the procedure. And Because you can imagine some parent reading it, oh, my child might die, oh, my child might lose his penis. Whose parents, what parent's going to do that procedure, Right. So they say, oh, there might be a lot, there might be bleeding, you know, I might be promised for a few days, it's very safe, whatever that means. It's really, it's really scandalous. I mean, it's really, and again, like, for me, what's most scandalous is not even that children are being harmed. I mean, that's extremely scandalous, obviously. I mean, that's why I founded Attorneys for the Rights of the Child 16 years ago. But in a sense, what's most scandalous is that we're still doing this now when we have so much information available and at our fingertips we can, we can learn about what studies are out there and, and also in an era when we don't even have enough to care for the people who need the care and for the things that really need doing. And it's just such a waste and such a tragedy. Do you think if people actually saw how the procedure was done, they would feel differently? I'm telling you right now, if a parent saw the procedure done, it wouldn't be done, 100 times out of 100. The baby's screaming, the baby's writhing. They say it's a five minute procedure, or 10 minute procedure. Do you know how long five minutes or 10 minutes is if you're in severe pain? Anesthetic can't stop the pain and, and anesthetic has its own risks. No, no parent would have, it's the same as the slogan that says 10 out of 10 babies oppose circumcision. 
10 out of 10 parents would oppose circumcision if they were properly informed by seeing a video of it. I mean, I would like to see a single parent that could sit and watch when a parent, you know, without a, he a healthy parent, a parent without, you know, psychological issues, could watch uh, psychological issues prior to seeing the video anyway, could watch that video and still want to have their child go through it, still consent to have their child go through it. There's no way. I mean, and again, there's so many problems with terminology because even the word consent is incorrect. I've written two law review articles about so-called informed consent. It's not consent. It's, it's parental permission for the practice. Consent is when the patient himself agrees, and that's never happening with infant circumcision. So we've got all these, but this terminology thing, it's, it's not just me nitpicking because the terminology is what allows it to persist. We're sort of telling ourselves little lies. Oh, it's only circumcision. It's not something threatening. It's not genital mutilation. It's not cutting off a needed portion of the baby's body. It's just circumcision, this nice word that we've heard for a long time. It must be okay. There's a word for it, a medical word for it. Why would there be a medical word for it if it wasn't medically beneficial? There's, there's no medical word for like chopping off your arm. I mean, why would there be a word for it? It's got to be, it's got to be fine. And so I think we, we really, and again, not in a conscious conspiracy way, but just in sort of a, a way that one event has followed another, we've convinced ourselves as a society that this is an, an okay thing to do. It's either good, or at least if it's not good, it's not that bad. And you know, my brother across the street, or my, my neighbor across the street did it last week. How, how bad could it be? My, he's a good guy. You know, He goes out and helps the brownies on weekends, goes around and sells cookies with them. How could he be a bad guy? It must be a good thing. Joe did it. And so it just gets perpetuated. And Parents have kids. I know when, you're, when you have your first kid, you really don't know what to do. You have a lot of questions. You're really unsure of yourself. Um, some other parent says, hey, you can have him circumcised? Oh, yeah, I should do that. That's what most parents do. Yeah, let me do that. And the doctor says, hey, you know, he'll maybe, maybe he'll have discomfort for five minutes. Oh, yeah, they go into shock. That's another thing doctors say. Oh, yeah, they go into shock. Or, oh, they're not crying because of the circumcision. They're crying because uh, they don't like their, their pants being pulled down. I mean, and if you watch the video, like there's this, uh, the, the screaming starts the instant the knife touches the penis. So it's completely untrue. It's just like, and you ask yourself, like, how can the doctor even believe this? But doctors are human too, and they, they have to create their own story so they can feel okay about what they're doing. Uh, to prepare for this interview, I watched a few videos about people who were intact activists and also people who were very much for circumcision and were arguing against your work. Um, and oh, so interesting. I, was... I should probably watch those videos. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I watched and read about a lot of the, the talking points. And um, I saw this one video of a, a girl that we're going to be interviewing. Her name is Karen Strogan, I think her name is. But she's Girl Writes What? She's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's She'll up be good. In Canada. Yeah, so yeah. she made a video about um, a general interview. Yeah, she's, she's been very good. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so she, she was getting very emotional, saying that this is just an atrocity. This is barbaric. This is mutilation. And um, how could people be doing this? And so she kept on saying this. And she said that the crying is just so intense and all this. And, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm not a parent. I've never had to choose if my son would be circumcised. I've never looked into it. I've never mm -hmm. talked to people about it before mm -hmm. making this film. And um, so when she was saying that the baby is crying during this, I was just thinking, oh, well, of course, babies cry. The whole birthing experience it's a different is kind dramatic. of. It's a totally different kind of crying, though. It's a crying that you never hear except for the circumcision. There, there's a level of, of level of it and a directedness of it and a... And a it's, 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 it's totally unforgettable. And that's what Marilyn Milo said, you know, and that's why she ended up stopping participating in circumcisions. But so, it's, not, it's not like a standard cry. It's completely different. So I, I uh, made the tough decision to actually watch the video. Oh, yeah? Which was hard to find yeah. online. But videos are, hard, videos are painful to watch. I've watched a number of them. It, it completely changes your mind. Yeah, well, that's what I say, 10 out of 10, you know. It's like, bring me the parent that would do it to their child after seeing that. And they should watch that before they make the decision. Of course Why? they should. Of course they should. Why aren't they educated about what their child is going through days after birth? I mean, I can see a doctor arguing, oh, well, we don't show videos of, of you know, um, open heart surgery before before we agreed to an open heart surgery on a child that needs it or something like that. But, I mean, the difference is, again, is that open heart surgery, 
it's not done to all, to all children or all male children or all female children. It's, it's just done when it's needed, when it's essential. And that, that's really the difference. And um, yeah, it really is pretty amazing. <laughs> It's kind of left me speechless, so yeah. it's very frightening. And yeah. I'm actually debating possibly showing it in the film. And I don't know if that would be too um, daring to force people to watch it. I don't know. You're making a film about circumcision. It seems like showing a circumcision is a pretty reasonable thing to do. You know? um, yeah. Have you heard of many men who are circumcised who are angry that they were? Sure, there's a huge group of them that are. Um, there have been um, people who've come forward, men who've come forward. There were two of them at the 2010 Berkeley and No Cert Symposium, um, Thomas Hennon and uh, Robert Johnson. They both wrote articles stating their outrage and uh, upsetness about it. And um, one of them had, had very detailed memories of the whole event and then went, I think it didn't happen at new, when he was newborn, I think he was three or four, something like that. And he went back to the hospital and found that all the memories were actually correct, that he actually was remembering what, what really happened in terms of like where the rooms were placed and where there was sunlight and things like that. Um, there, there's a lot of men, I mean, I mean, Tim Hammond's done a lot of work, the same man that I worked with in the 90s when I first got ARC started. He's, he's done a lot of work um, collecting men's stories. He published a book in the 90s called Awakenings. And then recently, he, he, since we're now in the internet era, he did a, sort of an online version of that that collected literally hundreds of males' responses and discussions of their stories. Now, it's, it's not an objective survey. I mean, the, the men who are coming to him are at least predominantly coming because they do feel some less than ideal feelings about it happening, but just just the fact that you can get hundreds and hundreds of respondents so easily, and um, you know there, there are psychological studies that have been done of it. I actually co-authored an article about the psychological aspects, and and we talked about uh, Reinhardt's work on post-traumatic stress disorder, and all sorts of evidence about various psychological sequelae that come from circumcision. So um, yeah, there there definitely is an impact, at least in some cases. After watching the video, um, I could definitely see how PSTD would be an issue. Do are there any findings on that um, post traumatic stress? Oh, P P PTSD. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's you know, it's a trauma. I mean, in a lot of cases, maybe it happens too early to be remembered consciously. But whether it's remembered consciously or not, I mean, numerous people have done work showing the impact of early experiences. I mean, David Chamberlain's written books on the topic, and there's been studies showing that um, the same kind of trauma that happens to you at, at birth, if you had a traumatic birth of, in some way, tends to get replicated later, and it, it doesn't. it's not like an equation, it's not always gonna happen, but it's a strong correlation. I mean, there've been studies showing that. It's not surprising. I mean, it's an experience, it's gotta go somewhere. It, Probably in most cases doesn't again doesn't get registered consciously because you're just a, a neonate, but um, but it does get it does get recorded somewhere and have and have some impact. I mean, you know, many of us have no memories of of it happening to us, but there are some who do and and you know have some concrete reasons for what they say, like like this man who wrote about it very convincingly. Yeah, I mean, for some for some men feel like it really was like the most traumatic event of their life, and it really harmed their life, some people feel it ruined their life. I mean, I don't feel that way myself, but a lot of, at all, but I mean, a, a lot of, or, or, I'm not, not necessarily like a lot per, percentage-wise in terms of the whole population, but I mean, a, a good number of men do feel that way. If you look at the sources I mentioned, you'll, you'll see that repeated over and over. Well, after seeing the video, I feel like if that was done to me, even if I don't remember it, I would be angry. Well, exactly. So that would be exactly. So, you know, James Prescott, among others, has said, well, you know, let's look at society and let's look at what men are doing and let's look at, you know, and there's some evidence. It's it, Again, it's not a straight line sort of thing, but there's some evidence that circumcision is loosely associated with there being greater violence in a, in a society and... and uh, I mean, you know, Israel and the U.S. are two very violent countries, right? And that's not conclusive. It's not the sort of evidence you can, you can rely on scientifically. But, 
again, you know, you're doing this violence to the kids. Do you think it has no impact? Do you think it has no repercussions? So it seems unlikely to me, at least that 100% of the time there's going to be no repercussions. I would like to know if there is any correlation with uh, violence with those that are circumcised versus uncircumcised, because it seems like having that done at such an early age would make you like fearful and angry about the world and other people. Um, yeah, well, nobody's done a study saying, you know, what percentage of felons are circumcised versus intact and what percentage of... Um, I agree. I mean, it does seem, just from a sort of common sense viewpoint, it's is it going to make you a nicer person to have this thing done to you when you're an infant, strapped down, powerless? Seems unlikely to me. Seems more likely it would make you a less nice person. But I can't prove that. I don't, I don't have... I haven't taken 500 babies and strapped them down and 250 of them I circumcised and 250 of them I didn't and then I let them live for 30 years and saw which ones robbed banks and killed people. I haven't done that study. It would be unethical anyway. Mm -hmm. um, is there any funding for research in this field? or? Well, there's no funding at all for, for studying the benefits of the intact body. That's the other thing is that the, the incentives all flow in the wrong direction. I mean, and, and, and this has been seen in many areas of, you know, holistic health practice. I mean, there's... And again, you know, my, my wife's a doctor. I mean, I don't get too woo-woo about all these things, but I do try to keep a certain amount of openness to alternative approaches. And there are alternative approaches that there's really strong evidence are really helpful with cancer. And I mean, I, I think that, you know, often there's medical modalities that are good to use too, not that you have to avoid them entirely, but there's supplemental practices that can help. And um, it's, not an, it's not an all or nothing thing, but the problem is that, Nobody can make any money off the value of the intact body. Nobody can make money off leaving a boy's penis alone. There's no money in that. And not only is there no money in that, there's no prestige in that. I mean, it's what you should do, and it's what we do with girls in the US, but there's no incentives to really promote that. So nobody ever does a study It'd be hard to set up, but it probably could be done to see, well, are the benefits of being intact? What are the benefits? You know, how strong are they? Are they important enough that we shouldn't be circumcising? I mean, nobody ever does that research. And, and there was one study done, um, Sorrells, S-O-R-R-E-L-L-S, -L -L and some co-authors did about sexual sensitivity a few years ago, showing that there was definitely a loss of sensitivity um, due to circumcision. And, and that study had some support from the intactivist community. I mean, we really wanted to know the answer. We really wanted to know, you know, is there an impact on sensitivity? It turned out there was. And, but, you know, nobody's paid for this work. I mean, there's, there's a couple people that get extremely meager stipends that you can barely even survive on that work like around the clock, 70, 80 hours a week, you know, on, on this stuff. And I mean, I work probably 25, 30 hours a week. You know, I don't make anything on it. I, I mean, I choose to do it. I'm not complaining in any way, but that's just the way it is. There's no financial incentive whatsoever. And, you know, for all of us, I mean, all these papers get published and we travel to conferences and, and we're all sort of always trying to raise the $3.65 that we need to do the next project, you know, off lunch money, off some friend of ours or something. And But that's been part of the problem with the movement is we haven't been able to really step up because there hasn't been any funding source, really any obvious funding source. A lot, of, a lot of issues, you know, there's a sort of natural funding source, and sometimes it involves figuring out how to market things or how to package things or how to get the interests of the particular um, possible source of funding. In this case, we haven't seen it. I mean, maybe someone will come along and come up with some brilliant way to do it, but it's really just seemed like holistic issues and, and supporting the intact body, just uh, there, there's no money there. And there's no, and when I say money, I don't just mean money. I mean, there's no incentive among the people with high prestige and the, the physicians and the professors at, at universities. I mean, Johns Hopkins, again, I mentioned them earlier with regard to John Money. Johns Hopkins is driving this whole HIV thing, which is insanity. I mean, you know, um, this whole ridiculous thing that, you know, A, that HIV cures or helps reduce I mean, sorry, that circumcision helps reduce HIV in, in Africa, which itself is like completely suspect, and there's like a million problems with those studies, ethical problems, data problems. But then, to make it worse, 
they try to do exactly what they told us at the beginning they wouldn't do, but which we knew they were going to do, and we were unfortunately proved right. Namely, they try to take this data from Africa and bring it to the U.S. where there's completely different modalities for transmitting HIV, completely different health practices. I mean, in Africa, one of the best places best to get HIV is in a health clinic. Was well, that true in the U.S.? No, of course not. Completely different situation in the U.S., and yet they're trying to import this idea that was flawed to begin with, not just flawed, but you know, completely a non-starter. In Africa, they're trying to bring it to the U.S. and use it to justify neonatal circumcision. I mean, the mind boggles. It's just, if, it, if, it was, if somebody wrote a movie or a novel and, you know, we didn't circumcise, we never had, and, and they, it'd be like, come on, this is ridiculous. This is so implausible. Like, I'm not going to read your book. It's ridiculous. Nobody can believe it. And yet that's the reality that we have. Um, you were saying that in your generation, um, fathers were saying, oh, I want my son to look like me. I feel like with my generation, the biggest argument, or not argument, but understanding of why boys are circumcised is for cleanliness and prevention of STDs. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I can talk about that. I mean, so prevention of STDs, I mean, we already sort of talked about this, but, um, you know, I, I guess you, you back up. And first of all, like the question to me is, well, why are we even studying you know, sexually transmitted diseases in male circumcision. I mean, why, there's this massive compulsion we seem to feel as a culture to like frantically find a reason to justify this thing. It is the weirdest thing, like why don't we just stop it? We, again, we don't have enough resources to do this needless practice anyway. Why don't we do the things that need doing for, for patients? Why don't we help patients and make them healthier? And why don't we stop doing things that don't have medical basis as again, even the American Academy of Pediatrics finds itself forced to agree. So it's odd that these studies are going on in the first place, but okay, they're going on. And by the way, there's been studies showing that female circumcision can help reduce STDs, but nobody for some bizarre reason is proposing doing female circumcision. Well, I'm not proposing doing female circumcision. I also oppose doing male circumcision. I mean, why would you cut any child to try to stop a disease? First of all, you're not going to get STDs till you're sexually active, which is many years down the line. It's completely out of line with any sort of public health and medical practice to do some practice 20 years in advance on the speculative idea that you might contract this disease 20 years later, they might not have a vaccine yet, they might not have a way to cure it yet. There are lots of ideas out there right now that seem really solid about reducing HIV and stopping HIV. I mean, there are ideas that are really likely to be viable within the next few years. I'm not an expert on these things, but I'm reliably told that by physicians who are experts on these things. And regardless of that, the whole thing is, is medical craziness and, and wouldn't be done except that we are basically, as a society, crazy on this issue. We've basically lost contact with reality on this issue. So, you know, the STD studies, the HIV studies have been refuted over and over. That, I mean, there's so many problems with the studies. They stopped them when the data started turning the other way. In some cases, they committed ethical violations. They, the, the, the number of people that were supposedly prevented from getting HIV due to being circumcised was an extremely small percentage of the total number in the study, just a little over 1%. So they try to present these numbers as saying, oh, there was a 60% improvement rate, but the so-called 60% improvement rate is, is just out of this 1%. So in other words, 1% are, are being saved, so, so that's the real number that you should be looking at. And you have to counterbalance that against all the harms, against all the risks, and against the general principle that functional tissue should stay on the body unless there's a reason to take it off. I mean, it's, it's just, I don't even know how to even explain all the ways in which it, it's a flawed idea. And Johns Hopkins should be ashamed of itself for driving this thing. And you know, there's a lot of status and a lot of egos wrapped up in it. And at this point, it's a juggernaut. And it's very hard to stop the train and get off it. And it's very hard to see objectively. I mean, we're all in love with fancy institutions and, and people with professional impressive credentials. I mean, I as much as anybody else, you know, it's impressive. It's like, wow, you know, Johns Hopkins must be right. I mean, I must just be too dumb to understand this because they're saying there's a reason for this. So, and you asked me about, um, uh, well, cleanliness, cleanliness. Oh, I love yeah. cleanliness. I love cleanliness. Okay. So let's look at this for a second. Do we, do we amputate female breasts so that it's easier to clean under the breasts? Do we amputate 
female genitalia so that it's easier to clean the genitalia. Female genitalia has more problems with hygiene than male genitalia because female genitalia by definition is inside the body, male genitalia is outside the body. Therefore, if anybody's, if anybody's genitalia should be modified to improve hygiene, it should be females. I'm not proposing doing it to females. I'm just making the point that why are we focusing on this insane thing for so-called cleanliness? It is nuts, folks. It is nuts. It's patronizing. Males can learn how to clean themselves. If you're a parent and you're not teaching your child how to clean himself properly, you are blowing it. Get out some soap and water, teach the child how to clean himself. And if he feels a little embarrassed because it's his penis and he feels private, let him learn how to clean himself himself. Just make sure that he's done it. But you gotta figure this out, folks. It, it doesn't get solved by cutting off body parts. We don't do it with anything else. Um, I mean, you know, there are, there are females whose chances of getting breast cancer would be, who are statistically really likely to get breast cancer, whose chances of getting breast cancer would be greatly reduced by amputating their breasts. I mean, I mean, we're talking orders of magnitude more than anything that's ever been claimed for circumcision. Nobody proposes doing that. I mean, I think, I think Angelina Jolie did, did that as an adult, didn't she? But she's an adult. I mean, she chose to do that. So, so, nobody's, so nobody's forcing this on children. And yet, if you look at the numbers, it would be orders of magnitude more sensible than male circumcision. I mean, it is so insulting to think that males can't learn how to keep themselves clean. It's just, and the whole penile cancer is the same thing. I mean, penile cancer mostly hits very elderly men who are very poor and in very poor living conditions and, and hygiene is poor. So let's improve the hygiene. Let's, let's do the easy fixes. We're, you know, there's so many issues here, but we're such a cutting culture. We tend to think that we solve problems by cutting them out and you know, it, it's often not the solution. It's often not the way to fix things. Well, how about those that argue it's for an aesthetic reason? Well, that's arrogant. I mean, you're going to, somebody's going to sit there and tell me that their third party opinion, it looks nicer to cut off a part of somebody's body for their own benefits. What if I think it looks nicer to cut off female genitalia? And again, I'm not proposing that. What if I think it looks nicer if, if you know, my son is an amputee or, or my daughter only has one ear? I mean, there actually were deaf parents who were proposing that their children should be made deaf too because they're deaf and they want to perpetuate deaf culture. And there's been defenses of that actually by some of the same people that, that some of the same so-called ethicists that support circumcision. It's, it's, it's a sham. It's all outrageous. I mean, it's, it's come on. Seriously? <laughs> Thank Can you. Can interject something yeah. here? Yeah. Have you ever watched Sex in the City? No. Occasionally. Oh, huh. There is an episode there's an episode relating to circumcision, I know. Yeah. Yeah. About what? Well, they're like, you know, the four of them, I think they're around their <laughs> breakfast, you know, in the restaurant, and they're talking about being with a man who's uncircumcised. Yeah. Uncircumcised, and I think Samantha's with someone who's uncircumcised at the moment, and the Intact. girls are all, yeah. um, like, ew, you know, kind of thing. So they're having this conversation about whether or not. But I'm sitting here listening to all this, and for the first time in my life, seriously, I'm like, why are we doing this? No kidding, it's, no kidding. It's no kidding. the population goes on its way as lemmings because this is, it, there's no questioning it because this is what's done. Well, I, I think it's really, I've written about this, I think it's really hard for fish to see the water they're swimming in, and I think it is so hard for us to see it as a, as a culture, and um, it's, it's just so pervasive. I mean, I mean everywhere we, where we go, it, it's, it, circumcision just seems like such a mild practice and so accepted and so common, and, and we feel like we, we know what it is. I mean, I'm not immune to that. I mean, I grew up in the U.S. I, you know, it, it seems innocuous even, even to me when I, when I don't really think about it and remember what I've learned and what I've come to, to understand. And, and yeah, I mean, to a large extent, it, that's what keeps it going is this, is this subtle acceptance. It's, it's just really hard for us to step outside the frame and, and look in. And I, I wrote an article analyzing um, 19th century Indian um, infanticide of female um, children, female genital cutting, male genital cutting, foot binding and artificial cranial deformation, which happens around the world, many different cultures. When you're under one year of age, your, 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 your cranium can be compressed. That's why Nefertiti looked like she did and deformed. And there are cultures all over the world that, that still do that. And so I analyzed those five practices and I didn't know what I would find quite honestly. And 
Interestingly, a lot of the same justifications are used for all five of those practices. Each culture really believes that, oh yeah, well, foot binding's for the good of the daughter because then they'll be marriageable and they'll be able to get a husband and they'll fit into society. And, 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 and you know, I mean, I, I can't, you can't really argue that killing uh, girls is, helps the girls. I mean, that's the exception. But, um, you know, the artificial cranial deformation makes them more beautiful. It alters them, just like circumcision does. It alters their head so that it looks really nice and, and really fits in with what we want our, our children's heads to look like. And, and so, you know, I, I really, it was amazing to me because it really, really turned out that each culture really strongly believes in the rightness of what they're doing. And um, so I don't fault a circumcising culture any more than I fault any of these other cultures. I just want it to stop, you know. It's just like it doesn't need, it doesn't need to happen anymore. It's time to lay down the knife.